Operation Instant Thunder was the preliminary name given to planned airstrikes by the United States during the first Gulf War. Designed by Colonel John A. Warden III, it was planned to be an overwhelming strike which would devastate the Iraqi military with a minimum loss of civilian as well as American life. The Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in August 1990 was the culmination of a long dispute between two neighboring and very different Arab states. Both were oil producers, but Iraq was a brutal dictatorship fielding the fourth largest army in the world, while Kuwait was a more benign totalitarian state whose native population was outnumbered by guest workers drawn from all over the Arab and Muslim world. After the conclusion of his war with Iran, Saddam Hussein turned his attention towards Kuwait. Kuwait had heavily funded the eight-year-long Iraqi war against Iran. By the time the war ended, Iraq was not in a financial position to repay the $14 billion it borrowed from Kuwait. Iraq argued that the debt should be forgiven since the war had prevented the rise of Iranian Islamic fundamentalism in the Arab world. Kuwait's reluctance to pardon the debt created strains in the relationship between the two Arab countries. According to George Perot, the FBI interrogator who questioned Saddam Hussein after his capture in 2003, Iraq tried repaying its debts by raising the prices of oil through OPEC's oil production cuts. However, Kuwait prevented a global increase in petroleum prices by increasing its own petroleum production thus lowering the price and preventing recovery of the war-crippled Iraqi economy. This was seen by many in Iraq as an act of aggression, further distancing the countries. Though Kuwait's large oil reserves were widely considered to be the main reason behind the Iraqi invasion, the Iraqi government justified its invasion by claiming that Kuwait was a natural part of Iraq, carved off due to British imperialism. After signing the Anglo-Ottoman Convention of 1913, the United Kingdom split Kuwait from the Ottoman territories into a separate sheikdom. Saddam's government argued that Kuwait was legally and historically a province of Iraq. In July 1990, Iraq began massing troops on the Kuwaiti border. April Glaspie, the American ambassador to Iraq, in a meeting two weeks before the invasion of Kuwait, informed Saddam Hussein that the USA had no interest in the internal affairs of the Gulf region. Saddam took this to mean that there would be no opposition to his annexation of Kuwait. If the United States had clearly signaled it would be wrong to attack Kuwait, and under the United Nations Charter, it's illegal for any state to challenge the territorial integrity of another, then, and the United States is obliged under the United Nations Charter and as a member state of the Security Council to, you know, help to assure the defense of those states, you know, who knows, that might have had the opposite effect of restraining Saddam Hussein. So I think it might be too strong to say uh, it encouraged him, but it might be fair to think about the counterfactual of what would have happened had the U.S. said something completely different. On August 2, 1990, overwhelming Iraqi forces overran Kuwait. In a single stroke, Saddam Hussein seized control of the world's second largest oil reserves and threatened the world's largest, those just over the border in Saudi Arabia. His troops seized anything valuable and shipped their ill-gotten gains back to Baghdad. There was some fear that the next stop might be Saudi Arabia, which would be a much bigger player. I mean, Saudi Arabia is the, the dominant state within OPEC because it produces an enormous percentage of the world's oil. And more importantly, it is the reservoir of much of the world's oil reserves. And so no one wanted to see, you know, that oil threatened in that way. Oil markets, like any other markets, appreciate stability, and so Saddam was bringing disorder. And so even if he was merely threatening Saudi Arabia and questioning the supply of oil, then that potentially could lead, and did lead, um, for a short time anyway, to increase in oil prices. What was really at issue for the U.S. was, in this kind of goes back to the Carter Doctrine, uh, of, of having somebody who is not controllable in charge of so much of the world's oil because being positioned in Kuwait, the next target logically would be the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia. And so that would give Saddam Hussein control over about 40% of the world's reserves. And that was just uh, you know, too much to tolerate. The world waited to see what Saddam would do next.
Led by the United States, an alliance began to form in response to the Iraqi threat to vital world oil reserves. The lingering phrase from that building of the coalition was this phrase, Operation Tin Cup. Um, you've probably seen images from film, right, where uh, somebody's turning a grinder and there's maybe a monkey or a person holding a tin cup out to have the money go in. That was what the, uh, the uh, unofficial name was for Secretary of State James Baker going around the world convincing other states that it was the right thing to do to stop Saddam Hussein then and uh, to help finance that operation. Um, and uh, the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, the Germans, and the Japanese, just those four states financed, I think, about two-thirds of uh, um, the first Persian Gulf War. And then uh, um, other states made contributions as well. So um, there was an enormous commitment by the U.S. of military force and troops. Um, but there was a genuine coalition of nearly 30 states with troops in the area and lots of money coming in from various places. Saddam invaded Kuwait in the early August um, of 1990 and the first Bush administration, uh, George H.W. Bush, they took the next, what, five, six months to you know, work with the Allies. It was considerably different than uh, what George W. Bush did uh, when he invaded Iraq in, in 2003. So um, it was, I think, a fairly skillful diplomacy uh, on the U.S. part uh, and a different notion than what we saw later, too, a, a notion simply of building a multilateral coalition, uh, of getting you know, the Saudis to fund a good part of it, Large American air and naval forces, together with elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, were deployed to the Gulf in an operation called Desert Shield, with the intent of defending the Saudi oil fields. Today, as president, I ask for your support in a decision I've made to stand up for what's right and condemn what's wrong, all in the cause of peace. In my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. First into the breach in a powerful display of strategic mobility of air power were 48 F-15 CD Eagles of the U.S. Air Force's first tactical. They were deployed from Langley Air Force Base in Virginia on August 7th, less than a day after King Fahd of Saudi Arabia requested assistance. The Eagles flew armed and were ready to fight their way into the theater of operation on the possibility that Saddam had not stopped in Kuwait. Landing in Duran, the Eagle drivers looked around and were relieved to see the airfield still in friendly hands. The flight was on patrol over the Kuwaiti border 17 hours after taking off from Langley. The situation in the region was bleak. Nine of Saddam Hussein's elite Republican Guard units stood at the Kuwaiti border ready to drive south into the Saudi oil fields. It quickly became apparent that the F-15Es were the only force that could delay or harass such an advance. The price they might have to pay in the process was unthinkable. By August 11th, there were 12 F-15Es on alert at any given time. These were armed with MK-20 Rakai area munitions that released hundreds of golf ball-sized bomblets over an area as large as a football field and were therefore highly effective in destroying lightly armored troop formations. Two aircraft stood ready to defend the base or a strike package from enemy attack. They were loaded with AIM-9 Sidewinder and AIM-7 Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles. Luckily, during those first critical days, the feared Iraqi Republican Guard units and Iraqi Air Force never moved south. The reason for this was simple enough. Saudi Arabia was beyond Saddam's grasp simply because of the limiting logistical factors inherent to his forces. This would also prove to be a critical factor in Iraq's ability to hold on to what it had seized. In the air, the coalition's opponents were the men and machines of the Iraqi Air Force. By the summer of 1990, the IRAF constituted the sixth largest air force in the world. 
The IRAF air threat was significant, mainly because the Air Force was a source of pride to Saddam, and he had therefore seen to it that it was powerfully equipped. It comprised a mixed array of aircraft capable of fighting for air supremacy, repelling ground-based assaults and attacking strategic targets. The IRAF had eight squadrons of French-built Mirage FIEQs, equipped with modern air-to-air -air missiles. For attacking coalition troops, 10 IRAF air brigades were equipped with variable geometry MiG-23BNs and SU-2022s plus Hawker Hunters. Three TU-22 squadrons, a TU-16H6D squadron, and two SU-24 squadrons completed the air-to-ground contingent. The SU-24 was comparable to the F-111 and had the capability to mount devastating attacks against ground and sea targets. But the biggest threat to coalition aircraft came from five brigades of MiG-21, MiG-23, and MiG-25 fighters and the highly regarded MiG-29. The MiG-25s were operated as part of a composite interceptor reconnaissance wing. These planes could fly higher and faster than the F-15 and posed a considerable threat, especially to high-value asset aircraft such as the E-2 Hawkeye and E-3 Sentry AWACS and air refueling tankers operating close to the Iraqi border. Much feared in the run-up to war, the IRAF's MiG-29 posed only a limited beyond visual range threat to opposing aircraft. While it could employ the semi-active radar homing AA-10 medium-range missile, its radar was not optimized for a long-range fight, and it had poor look-down, shoot-down capability. Once into the dogfight, however, the tables could turn. The MiG-29 was highly maneuverable and could fire its short-range missiles off-bore sight with the aid of a helmet-mounted monocle sight. They also featured a passive infrared search and track sensor with which to stealthily pick out targets without tipping off their electronic radar warning equipment. As the F-15 CDs began their defense of the oil fields, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower entered the Red Sea. This was the first element of the most powerful carrier force ever deployed. By the time war broke out, it would include six carrier air wings. B-52 bombers were also deployed to Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, and air forces from other nations began to arrive in the region. These included a squadron of air defense tornadoes from Britain's Royal Air Force, deployed alongside similar Saudi machines, a Jaguar squadron in Oman, and the initial elements of France's Rapid Reaction Force. By the end of August, large numbers of U.S. Marine F.A. 18 Hornets and A.V. 8B Harriers were in theater. And for the first time, the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk Stealth Fighter was openly committed to the battle. The first 22 arrived on August 21st. In November, U.S. President George H.W. Bush decided to double the size of American forces deployed to the Gulf. The U.S.-led anti-Saddam coalition now had more than enough power to defend Saudi Arabia from any threat. During Desert Storm, I thought my boss, George H.W. Bush, did a masterful job of leaning on senior military professionals, taking their advice, and uh, letting them run the operation. But that was his judgment. Had he wanted to, he, was, you know, he could have been a much more hands-on leader. Putting U.S. forces there was a risk. The U.S. did not have the supplies or support crews to fight effectively if pressed. In the run-up to Desert Storm, everybody was worried that we were going to lose a lot of people. The Iraq Armed Forces, which were camped out in Kuwait, were very formidable if you just look at them as an order of battle. I mean, they had a lot of combat experience. They had like an eight-year war with Iran, you know. So these guys were hard, experienced with combat. And it was a sizable armed force. Like the, They had the sixth largest air force in the world at the start of that uh, desert storm. So I think Schwarzkopf ordered 20,000 hospital beds or something like that. 
six large hospital ships, a very extensive and elaborate uh, medevac operation was established because of the estimated casualties we were going to have in Desert Storm. So that was the mindset up when we went up to uh, Camp David. And uh, we spoke in turn about our readiness to take this on in, you know, in a less than a month. While the president and his advisors bluffed about the power on the ground and the efficiency of the deployment, in reality, chaos reigned. The Middle East fell under the jurisdiction of the United States Central Command. Commander-in-Chief of CENTCOM was General H. Norman Schwarzkopf. Orders issued from Central Command were lost, ignored, or countermanded by someone down the line who thought they had a better idea. Cargo planes were filled with the wrong equipment. Commercial airlines landed at empty airfields while soldiers stood waiting for planes that never arrived. Schwarzkopf cut through the confusion with a simple list of priorities. He wanted fighting men and tank-killing aircraft. With the AH-64 Apache helicopter and the A-10 Thunderbolt in theater, Saddam's offensive options would narrow considerably. Schwarzkopf's choice of the A-10 ruffled Air Force feathers. The A-10 was an aircraft that might well have been destined for the scrap heap had Iraq not invaded Kuwait. The Air Force openly scorned the aircraft, which is ugly and asymmetrical. Pilots called it Warthog rather than Thunderbolt. The real problem, however, is that the A-10 specializes in a mission that the Air Force would prefer not to have, close air support. As hostilities broke out in the Gulf, the Air Force was planning to mothball the entire A-10 fleet. But Schwarzkopf, concerned about the troops on the ground, needed a tank killer. Air Force appropriation priorities did not matter. The AH-64, on the other hand, is something of a pampered platform. As the Army's premier combat aircraft, it's the most coveted assignment amongst helicopter pilots. The Apache is highly maneuverable, equipped with sophisticated navigation and targeting gear, and sports a deadly array of weapons. Apaches were a prime choice for another reason. They can be packed a half dozen at a time into a C-5 cargo plane. By the end of August, the airlift was in full swing, with a plane touching down every 22 minutes. Pilots began to talk about an aluminum bridge between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. It's, it's the most impressive deployment of military forces in the history of warfare. To move that far, halfway around the world, the stuff that we moved, put it on the ground there, and then sustained it, okay? Mostly by air, uh, not for the heavy stuff, like POL and uh, munitions were brought in by the Navy. The heavyweight stuff has to be brought in that way. But everything else, all the high priority stuff, we flew in and sustained that operation and for six months. I mean, just absolutely astonishing performance on the part of our airlift uh, forces. Just remarkable. The scales finally began to shift in favor of the coalition. In fact, the coalition was now strong enough to undertake the liberation of Kuwait. A United Nations resolution gave Saddam Hussein until January 15th to get out of Kuwait if he failed to do so, the coalition was authorized to go to war. During World War II, the Desert Fox, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, discovered an essential truth about desert war. Whoever controls the skies controls the movement of troops on the ground. Saddam Hussein was about to discover the same essential truth. In August, immediately after Iraq invaded Kuwait, Air Force General Chuck Horner sat down with a yellow pad and a pencil. In a few hours, he outlined what would become the most effective air campaign in history. First thing we had to do was seize control of the air. That was fundamental to everything we did. Then we had the uh, obligation to take out his nuclear, biological, and chemical capabilities, isolate the central leadership of the country from the forces in the field, isolate those forces in the field by knocking down bridges and their ability both to resupply the battlefield and flee from the battlefield. And then finally, we needed to take out those systems that could inflict casualties on our friendly ground forces, armor and artillery. The plan would be fleshed out and finalized by air planners in Riyadh, but the basics in Horner's outline did not change. I said that uh, it wasn't going to be that tough, you know? 
And, after, and I, I had a lot of details to go with that, but afterwards, uh, the president drew Brent Scrocroft aside. Now, Scrocroft was a retired Air Force lieutenant general, okay? So he, and a fighter pilot, by the way, flew F-86s. Uh, and, and, of course, he was close to the senior Bush, and Bush drew him aside and says, this McPeak guy, does he know what he's talking about? <laughs> Because I said, you know, we had planned the air phase. I say we. Chuck Horner and the guys actually out in the theater had done this, had planned the air phase. And we thought it would last about, the whole war would last about a month. You know, we had phased it, phase one, phase two, phase three. And um, we were wrong. It lasted 43 days. As dawn broke on January 15, 1991, Saddam had until midnight to pull his forces out of Kuwait. No one expected him to move. The world held its breath and waited. Far from withdrawing, the Iraqis moved massive reinforcements into Kuwait and dug a formidable series of fortifications all along the Kuwaiti-Saudi border. Media pundits talked knowledgeably about the Iraqi berms or sand walls backed by anti-tank ditches and minefields. These were supported by entrenched troops and dug in armor and artillery. Making a frontal assault would be ruinously expensive for the coalition troops. But the war did not start on the ground. The extensive Iraqi fortifications did them no good at all. Desert Shield was in place. That was the operation that uh, sent the, the, deployed the forces into the desert. Uh, but I'd been there for, uh, couple months. In fact, I went over to, to Saudi Arabia in uh, January of 1991 and actually flew half a dozen sorties. I was still flying F-15s, single-seaters. And, uh, but I was, I was chief already, and I wanted to make an assessment of, you know, were we ready to go? Because I knew we were scheduled to go in January. So this was early January. And I got back to town. And uh, the president uh, heard about this trip I'd made to the sandbox some way and uh, asked me over to lunch. So I had lunch with him and Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense, and uh, Brent Scrocroft, who was the senior, who was the national security advisor, just the four of us, president, upstairs in the White House, in the, in the family quarters. And the uh, president said, here you just been over there flying, you know. I said, yeah. He says, How's, how, how, what do you think? I said, we're ready to go. Said, but because at the time there was some more talk about delaying further. Colin Powell didn't want to, really didn't want to fight anyway. <laughs> he wanted to continue with the uh, sanctions and the, you know, international diplomatic pressure and try to get him out of Kuwait that way. And Schwarzkopf was happy to continue to, you know, position and get ready. But we had had air forces over there. We, we sent our first squadron in, you know, within 48 hours of their, their, uh, of their uh, invasion of Kuwait. So we'd had guys in the desert for six months getting ready, you know, doing push-ups and wind sprints for six months. And my concern was, I don't care when the Army gets ready. Let's, let's start the air war, you know. And whenever they want to join in, they can join in. So I told the president, look, we're ready to go. My real, my real concern is if we delay much longer, you know, we'll begin to get people a little bit, uh, uh, you know, unhappy or fatigued around the edge, just waiting for things to happen. On the night of January 16th, 17th, the skies of Baghdad lit up as Iraqi gunners blasted at targets they could not see. Explosions ripped through the night as American F-117A stealth fighters and BGM-109 Tomahawk cruise missiles hit with pinpoint accuracy Iraqi command and communications targets, beginning the process of cutting Saddam Hussein off from his armies. Operation Desert Shield had now become Operation Desert Storm. Tomahawk cruise missiles are essentially pilotless aircraft equipped with 1,000-pound warheads. Despite their high profile, 
The effectiveness of cruise missiles in the Gulf War has never been publicly established. The Department of Defense released thousands of pages of statistics about virtually every aspect of the war in the Persian Gulf. Yet about the cruise missiles, the Pentagon remained oddly silent. In its final report to Congress, the Department of Defense would say only that cruise missiles had a launch success rate of 98%. What percentage of tomahawks hit and destroyed their targets remains classified. But there are clues that seem to indicate that cruise missiles weren't as effective as the public believes. The General Accounting Office cited one post-war analysis that suggests that half the missiles never reached their intended targets. According to two different reports, cruise missiles that struck the Iraqi Air Defense Operations Center in Baghdad left only small craters in its roof. That's why three-quarters of all the missiles used in the Gulf were launched in the first three days of the war and none were fired after February 1st. Even with shortened operations, the U.S. fired more than $380 million worth of cruise missiles at Iraq. At 2.30 a.m. Saudi time, 10 stealth fighters slipped out of Saudi airspace into Iraq. Silently, their computerized navigation systems guided them through the half-hour flight to downtown Baghdad. Flying undetected over the city, a slight press of buttons on pilots' control sticks delivered laser-guided bombs to crucial targets such as early warning radar control centers, radio towers that formed the nucleus of Saddam's communications network, and the air defense headquarters. In a matter of minutes, the heart of Saddam's air defense was cut out. Stealth pilots skirted through a lethal barrage of anti-aircraft artillery from below, but they kept their bombs on target. In only 15 minutes, they guided their invisible planes above the flak and then headed for home. The opening round had gone precisely as planned. It was definitely more exciting than I'd anticipated. Uh, they shot more bullets than I thought were ever made. It, it, it was an experience uh, that you almost have to go through to explain. And when the shooting started, when the word came that it was time to go and do what we do best, uh, I thought we were very well prepared, very well trained, uh, very well practiced, and you just had to revert back to your old habit patterns, uh, pretend the threats weren't there, and, and just get, do the job that had to be done. The F-117 stealth fighter was developed secretly during the Carter administration. It was able to move through Iraqi airspace virtually undetected. In Baghdad, Iraqi air defense didn't know they were under attack until the first bomb landed. Uh, Desert Storm was, was the first, what I would call the first modern war, and what the army might call the last ancient war. The last war of the industrial age. It was an industrial war. That's probably a better formulation. And I thought of it as the first war of the space age. The black jet showed phenomenal accuracy, delivering 2,000 pound laser guided bombs through doorways and down ventilation holes to destroy underground bunkers. By doing so, they were gaining the upper hand in the air over the battlefield. From the outset, Central Command realized that air superiority would be essential to victory in the desert. To reach this goal, air planners formed strike packages, teams of aircraft, each with a specific role to play on a given mission. Sometimes numbering over 50 planes, strike packages had the same basic components. First are air-to-air -air fighters, next the wild weasels, whose job is to locate and knock out SAMs. These are followed by radar jammers. Behind the jammers come the strike aircraft, the punch of the packages. Bringing up the rear is another flight each of wild weasels and air-to-air -air fighters. With as much as five miles between each group, a single strike package covers a huge piece of sky. Persian Gulf pilots describe them as 40-mile-long gorillas. In the battle against the Iraqi Air Force, the undisputed king of the hill was the F-15C. Now, you could get in trouble in the F-16. So it was a kind of airplane that you'd rather have for your mistress. The F-15 is the kind you marry. It was reliable, dependable, never betray you, never did anything 
you weren't looking for. But for me, it was a big airplane, two engines, you know, big frontal section. Felt like flying a building rather than, a, than, a, than the F-16. But gosh, was it a wonderful airplane. And like I say, you could fly it straight up to zero airspeed and it would tumble around and just never do anything unpredictable. The kind you marry, the F-15. But I always liked the F-16. Capable of speeds in excess of 1,500 miles an hour and carrying both infrared and radar-guided air-to-air missiles, F-15s are fast and deadly. They're also heavy, weighing upwards of 60,000 pounds when fully loaded. In close quarters dogfight, the F-15's weight would be a huge disadvantage. Fortunately, modern air-to-air -air warfare is seldom a close quarters game. AIM-7 radar-guided missiles, one of the F-15's primary weapons, can destroy targets from 25 miles away. As the premier air-to-air -air fighters of Desert Storm, the F-15 did more to crush the Iraqi Air Force than any other coalition aircraft. Of 38 air-to-air -air kills, F-15s were responsible for 33. We're flying the F-15Es, our, uh, essentially our mission here at, uh, at the, with the fourth wing is to provide deep interdiction uh, support for the ground forces. The primary targets are uh, in, the, in the northern uh, part of the theater, the northern Kuwaiti theater, and essentially the interdiction portion of it is to prevent those forces from being brought to bear against the uh, four, four deployed elements of the Army and the Marines, the coalition forces. By the 10th day of Operation Desert Storm, what remained of the Iraqi Air Force had begun fleeing across the border and into Iran. Following the F-15s in strike packages were F-4Gs. Their mission, seek out and destroy any enemy installation or weapon system that uses radar. Their preferred weapon is the appropriately named HARM, or High Speed Anti-Radiation Missile. HARMs lock onto the radar signal and simply follow it to the source. In Operation Desert Storm, the F-4G wild weasels were so effective that most Iraqi SAM sites simply refused to turn on their radar. As a result, radar-guided SAMs, which figured to be the biggest threat in the Iraqi air defense arsenal, accounted for only 20% of coalition casualties. The main strike force was usually comprised of F-16 Fighting Falcons. Designed as a low-level attacker, F-16s flew over 13,000 combat sorties and dropped more than 20,000 tons of bombs. However, they were not as effective as the Air Force had expected. Beam F-A 314s an F-18 F uh, Hornet squadron that uh, is presently providing close air support and uh, deep strike support, along with anti-air warfare for uh, both imminent thunder and the Persian Gulf uh, Desert Shield operation in general. The reasons for the disappointing performance are easy to pinpoint. First, there was a critical shortage of the targeting pods needed to use guided munitions. As a result, none of the F-16s that flew in the Gulf used laser-guided bombs. While the Weasels had effectively neutralized the Iraqi SAMs, there was little that could be done to knock out the low-tech mobile anti-aircraft artillery. The Iraqis successfully forced the F-16s to altitudes above 12,000 feet. Finally, there was Mother Nature. The F-16 was designed as a clear-weather daytime aircraft. The entire 43 days of the air war were marked by low cloud ceilings and poor visibility. The F-16 barely had a chance to show its stuff. But uh, the weather was a factor we never thought it was going to be as bad. I mean, we lost a lot of sorties over there because the uh, weather was the worst in a decade or something like that. And this was fought in January and February, so these were winter months. And uh, we, so many of our sorties aborted in the air because they never found the target, couldn't get to the target. British and Saudi tornadoes used their JP-233 runway denial munitions against runways and taxiways. British losses were relatively high due to their low-level tactics. Starting from the first night of the war, raids were repeated every night for weeks. The effect was obvious, in spite of a sortie rate of more than 2,000 missions per day, coalition air losses were under one-tenth of one percent. We were buying the F-15. It was an expensive airplane for the time. And we knew we couldn't buy enough of them 
to uh, flesh out our whole force structure because it was, it was a Cadillac. You know? So we said, well, we're going to buy a Chevy here. You know, it won't be much good, but we'll be able to equip a lot of squadrons and keep the Air Force. You know? uh, so it's just going to be this little El Cheapo, uh, gunfighter, air superiority kind of fighter. So we had a competition. And uh, the F-16 was Lockheed's entry, and the F-17 was Northrop's entry. Well, the F-16 just, we had a fly-off and compared the two, and the F-16 was just, we, we, we let these contractors alone and said, you do what you want. And so the F-16 incorporated a lot of innovation, the, the, which would never have been in it if the Air Force had had looked over their shoulder, you know, and, oh, and micromanaged the design. The seat was leaned back 30 degrees. So the, the, the pilot has his knees elevated. So blood has a hard time getting around the corner and down to your feet. You don't black out so much. And when you're pulling heavy G load, that's excellent. Uh, side stick controller wasn't our idea. That was general dynamics, you know, idea, or Lockheed's before it. And I mean, it was General Dynamics or Lockheed's after, because Lockheed actually bought GD, bought the GD factory in which we, we made, subsequently made the F-16 in Fort Worth. So it was, it had relaxed air stability. You know, it was a fly-by-wire airplane that if the electricity all went gone, it went out of control. It was uncontrollable conventionally. So it's controllable only because you had redundant computers working to, to keep all the surfaces moving in such a way that you had sort of artificial stability. But as a result of the relaxed stability, it was very maneuverable. You know, it was a 9G airplane, our first real 9G airplane. And because it was so light, you could actually pull 9Gs and sustain 9Gs, at least for a while, at certain altitudes and certain aircraft weights. The F-A-18 pilot flies one of the most versatile weapons in the military. His plane can fight in the air and attack on the ground. He can defend himself and the fleet against a multitude of threats, and he can perform all these tasks in a single mission. Fighter pilot's brain is a certain size when he's standing here on the ground and we're just talking. You put a strap on an airplane, it shrinks down to about 50% of that. You, it's dark outside and a lot of things are going on. You're operating on maybe 10% of what you have, so we call it STEM power. So when you're on STEM power, you really want to be able to fall back on those things that you've always done. So it's the habit patterns that are going to keep you alive. For an attack mission, you're going to fly some kind of ingress. It might be low level, it might be high level. And as you're coming in, you're thinking about the target that you're going to attack, and you're also looking for other enemy airplanes on your radar. And if you, if you find some, what you want to do is try to shoot those guys down before they engage you, obviously, because that's better for you, you'll be alive, and also you'll, you'll, you'll accomplish your mission. If they engage your strike package, more than likely you'll have to jettison all the air-to-ground ordnance you have and maneuver with them till you, uh, till you can uh, either get away from them or shoot their airplanes down, your, your mission won't go. So you're trying to work on that, and then, then as you get in closer to the target, you're going to switch modes. You switch from your air-to-air -air mode to your air-to-ground mode, and you start looking to acquire the target visually with the, uh, you know, you use the systems on board the airplane to aid you, and then as you get closer, you acquire it uh, visually, and then you actually roll in on the target from high altitude and then release your ordnance. Sometimes you get overloaded. I mean, and then you have to kind of let some of the tasks go away. You just don't do them. Training isn't always enough for a supersonic jet pilot to survive combat. Uh, I, I still get scared, uh, real scared, and you get uh, kind of a little bit on edge, but that's pretty good, though. Gives that little burst of adrenaline there that keeps you on edge and doesn't allow you to become complacent. The coalition allies were superior to the Iraqis in numbers, control, quality, and training. Thanks to the sophisticated long-range radar and advanced command and control capabilities of the Boeing E-3 AWACS, coalition pilots knew exactly what was going on in the skies over the war zone. When Iraqi pilots tried to make a fight of it, they were knocked out of the sky, primarily by the F-15 Eagles of the U.S. Air Force. At least 130 U.S. Air Force Eagles participated in the Gulf War, together with four Saudi squadrons. Eagles scored 35 out of a total of 41 coalition aerial victories in the Gulf, including the only two non-American kills by an Eagle of the Royal Saudi Air Force's number 13 squadron. 
The result of all the attention by coalition assets, both on the ground and in the air, meant that the Iraqi Air Force played very little part in the battle, and a large portion of its most modern aircraft was flown to internment in Iran to escape destruction.